Hello, this is Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols. You're listening to Backstage Access. Rock and roll, baby. Hey, this is Chris with Backstage Access, and we are lucky to have guitarist Steve Jones from the Sex Pistols here with us today to talk about his brand new book, Lonely Boy. Well, welcome to Backstage Access, Steve. How are you this morning? I'm pretty good, love. I'm in, I'm in New York doing my uh, book tour. Awesome, and, awesome. Uh, all good. Where, where are you calling from? I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. Is this a good, is this a good, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. I sure can. All right. So you mentioned you're on the book tour, so let's talk about the new book, Lonely Boy. How did this project come about, or what made this the right time to kind of tell your tale? Um, it just felt right. I, I you know, I wrote, uh, I, attempt, no, I didn't attempt to write a book about 15 years ago, but I, I kept thinking about maybe it's time to do a book, and I never kind of got around to it, things to line up. And I'm glad I didn't do it back then because I'm a lot more, a lot more knowledgeable about myself, you know, now than I was 15 years ago. Right. And it seemed it seemed to line up. Uh, and I, there was a couple of agents that were interested. I, you know, I I, I, um, I talked to a few ghostwriters, one that I liked, and it just fell into place. But it, but, actually quite painless. I thought it was going to be a lot harder than it was. <laughs> now, you're very open and honest about so many different things in the book. Uh, sexual abuse, addiction, everything that was going on with the band. Did you have any misgivings about kind of delving into all that and going public? It was more about going public than, than, than the misgivings. I mean, I knew what happened at this stage of the game. None of that stuff was a mystery to me. Right. But like you say, it, it was a bit like, oh man, I don't know if I want everyone to know this. People might turn on me or think I'm weird or something. But I think I did the right uh, the right choice because it seems like people are responding to it. That I haven't known, seen one lousy review. It's all been very positive and people that read it, you know, they tweet me saying this was a great book. Thank you for doing it. And and I'm, I am glad that I did it, even though it is kind of revealing and personal. A lot of the early stuff, I'm still I'm still glad I did it. And it is. And it's a fascinating story as well about the whole beginnings of the band and you know the Sex Pistols and the whole punk rock movement. And the question I wanted to ask was about these types of musical, for lack of a better word, I'm going to call them explosions. You know, you got punk, you had things going on in the 60s and Hate ashbury you had the Sunset Strip in the 80s. So in the case here, your King's Road, you know, Let It Rock shop, what is it about the particular area or the shop in particular that kind of drew people in to that whole scene and made things kind of happen? Yeah, well, that was definitely the, the eighth Ashbury of, uh, of punk rock, uh, Mountain Shop, Let It Rock. It was the place that I used to go and hang out um, prior to the band ever being uh, in, in existence, and I became friends with Malcolm. It was a place that you could hang out. There was a jukebox in there. There was a couple of couches, and uh, he he was he was warm to urchins, you know. He liked... He liked the kind of underground type of people. He wasn't interested in nice people. <laughs> he was more about that, you know. And and and, and people were drawn to it. Uh, Like-minded people were kind of drawn to the shop. And everything revolved around the shop as far as the Sex Pistols forming. And uh, it was all based on, on that. Uh, you know, Glenn Matlock, the original bass player, used to work, you know, on a Saturday. I used to hang out there in all the time. John used to go in there sometimes, and uh, it all kind of, that was the glue. That was the meeting place, and we didn't even know it at the time. Right. That, that, was, the, that was the place where it all started as far as the pistols. Right, now, talking about the band again, one iconic album. You know, rise to fame, and just as fast, everything kind of collapses. With everything that was going on with the, the band, could could it have really happened any other way? 
No, I don't think so. I think that was the way it was meant to be. I mean, in hindsight, you can always say, well, if we would have just done this or just done that. It was meant to be a quick flash in the pan, change the course of music and, and get out. But it didn't end. It carried on, even though the band had broken up. The legacy of the Sex Pistols are still relevant 40 years later because of that crash and burn. Absolutely. You know, I... You know, so it was, all, it was one of them things, e even the forming of us, putting the four of us, five of us together, doing the one album, um, I think that was just, I don't think it was the way it was meant to be, you know, right. as simple as that. Now, what do you think um, was a real turning point for the band? I know that, you know, in the book you talk about, you know, being on the, the Bill Grundy show and all the kind of backlash from that. Do you think that was a real turning point or was it a different event that kind of led up to that? And back then, did you see it all kind of happening and you just couldn't put a stop to it? Um. Yeah, I think the Bill Grundy show was, was the beginning of the end. As much as we got some fantastic publicity, we were literally like a household name overnight. And um, it was great at first, but looking back on it now in hindsight, it really was the beginning of the end because it, it no one was interested in rehearsing, writing new songs. We were just all caught up in this whirlwind of media and, and just junk, you know, and it, and right. it, and it was too much, it was too much for us to do so. Absolutely. Um, now, towards the end, and, and you're filming this great rock and roll swindle movie, and things are kind of starting to fall apart, um, and then of course, you have Sid's death. Now, up until before he died, was it always part of the plan? Did you think it was going to get back together type of thing? And, you know, after, like, maybe something's calmed down and everybody had some time to um, stay away? Or did you know right away before he died that there was no more? Um, I mean, when I walked away from it in, in San Francisco, I was, I was tired of it. Um, and I didn't want nothing to do with it. I mean, in hindsight, maybe we should have regrouped when we got back to England, you know, rested for a couple of months and just kind of got our senses together. But no one was getting their senses together. We all went insane on in our own individual ways separately. Right. You know, Sid went off with Nancy to New York. John was just doing his thing, and me and Cookie were not interested in being in that band. So I really don't see that it could have could have happened again, you know. Right. Uh -huh. Now you've also talked, uh, obviously, with with Sid's death, but you've also talked about your own struggles with addiction, um, and and now that you're sober, what was kind of the breaking point for you? When did you really realize, like, hey, I can't do this anymore. I've got to get on track. Um. Well, it really. It re the coin really dropped in uh, 1990, the 28th of October 1990. That, that was the last time I, I, I did any drugs or alcohol. It was just, it was just a, a, a light, just a light bulb went off, off in my head and I got a moment of clarity. That like, what the hell am I doing? You know, before then, it was just keep pushing, pushing, pushing to keep doing drugs and trying to just, that was it. I didn't get any, I didn't get that feeling of, I didn't look outside myself and look at myself, or oh, what a mess I've become. And, uh, and it, it was, I guess it was an emotional bottom, that, that you would call it. And I, I needed to get to that place in order for me to turn it around. And I'm grateful that I did. A lot of people that are, not, are not as lucky as me, you know. So right. for whatever reason, for whatever reason, I don't know why I managed to uh, get through that. You know, and I've been 26 years sober now. Awesome. And uh, I'm pretty, I'm pretty in a good place, you know. Good. Now, um, there's a lot of stories um, in your younger years, especially in the book, and they're a little more lighthearted because you're um, nicking things left and right, you know, even the equipment yeah. for the band. What was the favorite item that you nicked over the years? 
And do you well, still have it? I mean, <laughs> it's got to, it's got to be David Bowie's microphone with his lipstick on it still. <laughs> I mean, I wish I still had that, man. I wish I still had that. I, I, you know, I was such an idiot. I didn't hold on to anything. And I, I'm still like that. I don't get attached to things. Right. But I think that, I think that was the crown jewel out of all <laughs> the things, you know. Now, did the Pistols ever have any gear stolen from them when, when you were a band? No, because I was too sharp, man. I was too, I, I, you know, I had me wits up, but I never left any stuff lying around. We never did because because of, of me, because I knew how easy it is for stuff to, to go missing. Right. The, no, <laughs> yeah, and I'm still like that to, today. It drives me nuts. I'm too <laughs> paranoid. Now, I think that young Steve Jones is going to come along and lift <laughs> something. Better safe than sorry. <laughs> yeah. Now, when people think about the Sex Pistols and, and talk about them, and um, you know, Sid and Johnny are the ones that people will kind of give the most attention to, or um, people who aren't even very familiar with music, but they've heard of them. Does it ever feel like yeah. a snub to you, or kind of piss you off because you know you were there from from day one? It's kind of your baby, so to speak, and. The, yeah, yeah, I, that, that definitely there was a, a bit of that where I kind of, you know, put in the shadows a little bit more. Um, but I think that was a big part of why I wanted to do my book, to, to get my two cents in there. Because because no one really knows my story, and it's all about, you know, Sid and John. Right. Obviously, obviously Sid's story is a lot more there because, you know, his death and the Nancy thing was a lot more dramatic. Sure. But I, I, want, I wanted to do my book to kind of show you how the steps just all started. No one really knows. Even back from when I was a kid, that's where it really started. And that drive, having a, you know, uh, an abusive stepfather, that drive was what pushed me into forming a band in the first place. And, and in getting everyone in the band, and that, and a lot of people don't know that, so that was a, that was an important part of it for me. Right, and I know you said there's um, well, there's been some Sex Pistols reunions, and I know you said there's probably a little chance um, of doing that. You really don't even talk to John. Do you have a relationship um, with the others in the band? I have a relationship with Cookie, the drummer. Okay. He's like my oldest, oldest buddy. I've known him since I was 10 years old. You know, we're, 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 we'll always be good pals. I speak to him all the time. He lives in England. I live in Los Angeles. Uh, Glenn, I don't really talk to. Um, and John, I never talk to, which is fine. It, it's like, uh, it's, you know, as far as me and John, it's like a divorce, you know, you never want to speak to your, your ex-wife, you know what I mean? <laughs> sure, that makes sense. Now, you've been in L.A. For, for quite some time, and I know you've got a radio show out there, Jonesy's Jukebox, and it's back, picked up on a, a station there. Um, how's the show going? It's doing really good. I've been there a year. It's on Cal OS, 95.5. It's a classic rock station in L.A. It's been there forever. I've been doing it a year, and... Uh, the, the, um, I pretty much get free range of what I, what I want to do. I can play any kind of music, have any guests. I can really talk about any subject. And I do it for two hours, and, and people respond to it. Because it's kind of wacky, it's not your normal radio programming. Um, and it's doing good. Dave Grohl uh, built in for me yesterday because I'm in New York. Um, he did my accent for two hours. In the, uh, <laughs> Roger Taylor, it's pretty funny. I think you can watch some of it on uh, Facebook or somewhere. Okay. Now, is the show um, online at all, so people outside of L.A. can tune in or not yet? You can listen to, you can listen to it live, a live stream okay. on the Cairo West website. Um, also, I want to add that I did the audio for my book, too, in my own voice. Okay. So, so I just thought people might be interested. Because I'd rather listen to an audio than read a book, to be honest with you. I'm not a big reader. Okay. And is that the audio version of the book going to be out at the same time as well? Is that going to be available right away? Yeah, it's out now. Okay. It's out now. Great. Awesome. Now, I know you did a few solo records um, over the years. Is there any plans for you doing any more recording or anything in the works on that end? 
I am getting the bug. I've got loads of riffs, loads of tunes. I need to I need to get busy with some more lyrics. That, that's where I balked with lyrics. Lyrics are, are fine hard to write, but I just need to sit down and, and get stuck in. And I, I am I am getting the itch to do like a record or an EP or something. Just you know, because the last time I done something was like 1989 uh, when I'm firing gasoline. Although I did have the Neurotic Outsiders. That was a good album. Uh, I guess that was the last time I really wrote a bunch of songs. So yeah, I think I think it's ready. And you don't do it to make money these days. Obviously, you know the record right. business is in the in the toilet. <laughs> but it, but I think if you create it, you know you've got to create. So yes, yeah, so I definitely do want to do do some more music. Now, the Sex Pistols are probably one of those bands that people would cite as a huge influence on them um, you know your guitar playing your riffs the whole style aside from you know the chaos of the band but just from the musical aspect of it and I know some of the bands have even done covers of your songs and that type of thing um, do you how do you feel about that in general are you kind of honored when they do that or what are your thoughts? Yeah, of course, of course. Um, it would be silly to say you're not, you're not, you know, you're not appreciative when other bands are, are kind of doing an ode to you. It's always good. Um, I think uh, Anthrax, I think um, uh, Joan Jett, um, Guns N' Roses, uh, Megadeth, um... I mean, it's it's great. It, it's fantastic that you know they want to take the time and, and, and cover it. Motley Crue. Um, no, I like it. I'm I'm not like oh I don't care. I do care. That, that's not that's not the way I feel. I'm, I'm always uh, I'm always appreciative that people show some respect like that. Now, turning the tables a little, is there anybody um, that you would like to work with? Um, you know, somebody who's kind of an iconic. To you, I know that the faces were big for you um, when you were younger. Is there anybody that you would like to work with? Um, most of most of the ones I want to work with are all dead. <laughs> okay. You know. Fair enough. Bobby, Bowie, I would just, I would love to have done uh, some stuff with David Bowie. Right. Uh, you know, you know, who else I would like to, to do some stuff with is Jeff Lynne. Okay. I think that would be a good experience. I think he's a great record producer. I wrote a song with um, with uh, Roy Orbison once. We, we we didn't finish it because he died. He, he died. But that was a good experience. I, I like working with creative, good people. Well, maybe you'll get the opportunity um, if you get that new album going um, and, and have the time to actually uh, sit down and, and get some of those riffs in the studio. Yeah. Well, the book is, is excellent. It, it, it's a great read, and it really delves into a lot of things, as you said, that nobody really knew your side of the story, and I'm glad it's out there, and I know that everybody who picks it up um, will enjoy it. All right, love. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. We sure do appreciate it.